All right. Thanks again to everyone who's here. So excited for today's session with Dante. We've got a packed 45 minutes, so much to talk about. Giving Tuesday is around the corner, just over a month away. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. I believe this is our fourth webinar here at Give Butter that we've done. We've done a lot of different formats. And today we're really going to dive deep on a one-on-one, -on -one, just an interview, almost like a podcast here, but also taking your questions live. So we're going to learn a lot about Dante and his role over at Giving Tuesday and what he's thinking about and working on. And so, so is Giving Tuesday. Uh, we're going to talk about maximizing the day of Giving Tuesday for youth engagement, talk about top tips for fundraising with millennial and Gen Z donors on Give Butter. Kind of going back to our roots, Give Butter started off very focused on young donors. And I'm really excited to dive deep on that topic today. And we're going to lastly talk about what's trending in the world of virtual events and live streaming and some innovative things happening uh, when it comes to giving and how we can all give back in our own ways. And I'm just going to leave some time there at the end for, for live Q&A. But again, please leave your questions throughout and we will take them as, as we go and also at the end. For housekeeping, I have on the call Tori Miglio from our customer success team, as well as Kylie Davis from our marketing team at GiveButter. Thank you both for being here. And they will also be helping out with answering any questions that you might have. Use the Q&A for questions and we'll get to those either uh, live or respond with the chat. Um, anything related to anything else, feel free to leave a chat uh, using the chat bubble on your call. So I'm your host, Max Friedman. Like I said, I'm just outside of Washington, DC. Uh, as you may have, if you've been on other webinars that I've been, I probably seem like I'm changing my location every single time. Don't tell anyone I'm on the run. Uh, so don't, don't let anyone know where I am. Um, but today I'm in Washington, DC. Excited to be here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Give Butter, which I'll talk about in a sec. I'm really passionate about building technology for good. And I consider myself a self-taught designer. My co-founder would take issue with me calling myself a developer. I don't really develop anymore, but I'm, you know, it's part of who I am, I believe, and I'm a lifelong learner. So hopefully I'll add more things to that list pretty soon. My Twitter is there. So feel free to send me a tweet. Let me know how I'm doing uh, and say hello. And my email as well. I always love hearing from you and any feedback. So GiveButter is a fundraising platform based on three ideas to help you raise more, pay less, and give better. And the last piece is where our name comes from. We're really passionate about building a better way to give, focused on helping you raise more money from your supporters. We've been around since 2016. In the first three years of the company, the majority of our users were students in student groups. And in the last year, that has been replaced by traditional 501c3 nonprofits as our main user. We've grown a lot, particularly in the last year. And I'm really proud to share this slide that in the last month, GiveButter was rated the number one highest rated fundraising platform on G2, ahead of over 223 others in the space. So thank you to anyone on this call who was a part of that. If you're new to Give Butter, welcome. If you are familiar with Give Butter, welcome back. We love you. Uh, and so really proud of, of that and excited to see that continue to go and grow. But more excitingly, I want to talk about Dante, who is in New York City. He's the Director of Youth Engagement at Giving Tuesday and Outreach, I believe. Uh, and he is passionate about empowering young people across the globe to take action on important social issues. Dante develops programs and campaigns that engage Gen Z in leveraging the Giving Tuesday movement to activate for their communities. Dante is a teacher and a stand-up com comedian. He is dedicated to combating the countless barriers that at-risk students face to getting a quality education. He has a master's degree in educational technology and is a member of the junior board for the Renaissance Youth Center. Dante, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. All right, let's turn off this screen share and get to see your our big beautiful faces. You know, you didn't have a beard in your in your profile uh, in your in your in the picture that you sent over. How long has that been in the works? Uh, I mean, this just kind of started when quarantine happened. I just it was like you can find razors anywhere in any of the stores. So I just kind of like, fine. I guess I'll just roll on my hero. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing when in March it was like there was Google Trends popping up and it was like DIY haircuts and everything under the sun and now it's like heaters and it's like this we're going through these waves of things that are just getting totally sold out um right uh for me i could have gone all of quarantine and i wouldn't i would i would still look like this um but that's <laughs> not what we're here to talk about um 
tell us, tell us about yourself and your, you know, there's such, you have such an incredible background and culmination of experiences that led you to giving Tuesday. I would love to start with sort of a two part question. The first is about your journey to giving Tuesday and some of the, some of the sort of early, um, pieces of your career or, or earlier even that you want to highlight and what led you there. And in doing that, how about you just share a little bit about what giving Tuesday is? Cool. Um, yeah, where do I start? Um, so I'm down to everyone. I was born in a town called Tom's river on the Jersey shore. Uh, I grew up really, really poor, uh, managed to weasel my way into college. Um, and I went to school to be a teacher. And once I left, I knew that I wanted to go straight to the Bronx to teach. For those of you who are, you've probably heard of the Bronx, if you haven't. Um, it's the borough in New York City that has the most character. We'll put it that way. Um, so I knew I wanted to go there because even though I grew up really, really poor, I grew up in the suburbs. And you can grow up really, really poor in the suburbs and still, like, make it. Like, you have after-school programs. You have, like this and that. Um, and there's not a lot of those resources in the Bronx. So I was like, let me like use my privilege to go and kind of just try to, you know, pay it forward. Uh, so I went and I taught middle school. I taught sixth grade for a couple of years. Um, and, you know, at first every teacher shows up like bright eyed and bushy tailed. Um, and then everything just, I, everything was a mess. Like my sixth graders were coming in with a second grade reading level. And then they were being expected to do at, you know, satisfactory on like state uh, proficiency exams and stuff like that. Um, there was excessive absences. There's just a whole lot of what I've called barriers, barriers to quality education. Um, and there's normal things that we think of as barriers for like kids doing well in school, like being hungry or stuff like that. But um, there's things that you don't think about that are barriers that can keep a kid from doing well in school. Uh, and some of those things are like homelessness. Um, I had some students who were American citizens, but their parents were um, not citizens and they were afraid to come to school to do like conferences. So the kid wasn't getting proper help and the kid would just act out in school and not pay attention. Um, things like language barriers. I had a student who her first language was Bengali, but she could read you a paragraph in English perfectly well. But then if you asked her what it meant, she would have no idea, like no comprehension whatsoever. Um, and so I kind of just started seeing these things like the excessive absences, the other barriers. And I was like, you can be a super exceptional, intelligent kid and still not make it because of these things. Um, so I started kind of doing some advocacy through my stand up. I'd make jokes about being a teacher, but also kind of sneak in like, hey, this is the reality for kids where I teach. And that evolved into fundraising. Um, I did most of my fundraising using Facebook fundraising, and uh, I would fundraise for community-based organizations in the Bronx that I thought were doing the work to fight these barriers. And um, someone from Facebook noticed one of my fundraisers, I guess, because it was unique. It wasn't just like some national nonprofit. Um, and they kind of brought me into HQ and had me start doing commercials and stuff. And I got to meet the social good team um, and I kind of started being in contact with them and they would bring me to, they actually had me do uh, on a day they came to visit my school and talk to them about jobs in tech and listen to the students about like what their lives are like. Um, they had me do a press conference where Facebook was mentioning that they were going to do a match for Giving Tuesday, like a $7 million match for people to donate on Giving Tuesday. Um, and I spoke there and I was spotted by the Giving Tuesday team and they asked me to join and lead their youth initiative. Um, and that was in pretty much I joined the team in February. But as I told everyone here just now, like my students went, they were going through hell and I wasn't going to lead them halfway through the school year. Um, so I went full time in July and that's how I got here. That's my journey um, about Giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday is, we are a global generosity movement and we are focused on using generosity as a tool to progress us as society because honestly, we're not, we're, we're not in a good place right now. Um, and we believe that generosity is going to get us to that good place because generosity makes us feel powerful. It makes us feel happy and nice. 
And anyone can participate in generosity. It doesn't matter your age, race, socioeconomic status, religious status, your political affiliation, whatever it is, anyone can participate in generosity. Um, so that's kind of what we are about. Did I miss anything? Is there anything I didn't answer? That was a beautiful summary, Dante. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> you have a, it's an incredible background story. And, and I think the thing I want to touch on, I want to get to later is talking about, um, you mentioned a lot about barriers uh, for youth to engage and participate and get to the next level and progress and things that you noticed in the way. And I want to talk about what youth as a young person you can do to give and seek resources to help you if maybe you're not in a position to give. I want to talk about that later. But for now, I think we have a lot of maybe nonprofits in the audience who are thinking about engaging those youth, whether that's uh, as an organization uh, who has a young constituency, maybe you're a school, maybe you're a nonprofit that has a lot of youth uh, in it as just your uh, related to your related to your mission in some way. Uh, or maybe you're an organization that's trying to figure out how do you break into that uh, age group. What what is something what what would you say are important things that you've seen for nonprofits to like why why is youth engagement important <clears throat> is my question. I would say youth engagement is important because one kids have a lot to say. Kids are very observant. And kids know a lot more than we give them credit for. Uh, like kids, kids aren't bogged down by negativity yet. I feel like a lot of adults that I talk to in this day and age, they just have this mindset of like, it's a dog eat dog world. Like you only look out for yourself. And kids, kids are out there like, I'm happy. I got me and my friends. And kids are aware that things are going on in the world that are not okay. Like they're mad about climate change. There, there's things that bother them, but they haven't given up yet. They're not jaded yet. They're not like, woe is me. It's me versus the world. Um, so I think it's important to tap into that and also recognize that kids, first of all, if you want to get any type of youth engagement, the best way to do that is getting kids involved in the first place and telling them, hey, ask your friends. Kids want to be included in things. We know this. We were kids before. Kids fall to peer pressure but we only think of the negative peer pressure, like kids getting each other to smoke cigarettes. Kids can get each other to clean up garbage on the side of the road. Like there's positive peer pressure, um, but we don't tap into that. Um, and I think we also need to realize that getting youth involved is important because we're not all gonna be young and beautiful forever. We're gonna get old and tired and we're not gonna feel like running our nonprofits. We're not gonna feel like doing all this work and we need to have seasoned youth who are ready to grow into people who are going to take the helm and do the work that our nonprofits are doing or spread the generosity that we are looking to spread now. I love that. One thing we talked about yesterday on our LinkedIn live is a lot of these things start around dinner table, right? A conversation. Right. And, and, and one of the things that uh, I also want to ask is how you mentioned positive peer pressure. I love that. We, we use a term we call friendly competition a lot. Right. Uh, and it's just, it's a, it's competition, but it's friendly and it's, it brings people together, but also creates a, that competitive spirit. Everyone, you know, um, uh, not everyone, I want to say everyone, but I, a lot of people love a good competition or love at least that element of that, 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 that bringing people together accountability or just doing things as a unit. Right. Right. Um, what are some ways that we can create that positive peer pressure? Um, and how can we encourage, people to bring in their friends or bring in the bring in youth or foster those conversations like how do we how do we start that conversation at the dinner table how do we build friendly competition how do we create sort of positive peer pressure to move us in a in a in a in, a, in that positive direction as an organization i think the best way i mean one that's really up to your youth the youth that you already have engaged it's up to them to build that friendly competition i think what you can do to kind of facilitate that is allow and give the resources for the youth to express their passion. Because if you see someone's really, really into something and they really care and they're not looking for anything in return, then people are gonna wanna get on board. And I can say that because that's how I was able to meet all my fundraising goals. I just went out there and I was like, 
I'm just going to advocate for these kids. I'm this young teacher who's annoying and, you know, slacks at work, but I want to advocate for these kids. And people saw that passion and they were mm -hmm. like, it looks like this guy actually wants to do something. So I want to put my trust in him. And I think it goes the same with kids. You help that child, you help those youth show that they care and they're passionate. Other youth are going to want to get involved. And the number one thing, have them ask, like have them straight up ask, go to another kid and be like, hey, are you involved? Are you, I'm sorry, are you interested in getting involved in my giving initiative? Are you interested in helping me in my fundraiser? Are you interested in asking your family? At Giving Tuesday, we found that is literally the number one way to get others involved. Because you don't want to like, if someone comes in your face and is like, hey, do you want to like help me with this really nice thing that I'm trying to do for the world? You're going to look like a real jerk if you say no. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. We have a we have a question that I think is is in line with that from from Nolan. Hey Nolan, and Nolan also gave a shout out for New Jersey uh, in the chat. Oh, um, <laughs> oh Nolan. <laughs> um, but he wanted to know about up and coming trends. It sounds like that might be sort of one of them. You said one of the single most important things is just are you interested in in getting involved? So like we see a similar thing at Give Butter. We talk all the time about you got to ask, and the number one reason why we see people give is someone they know asks them to. And so it, it sort right. of takes that personal direct ask. Um, right. So I sort of have a, a I want to build off of Nolan's question in, in, in terms of trends, because I think we'll talk about things like live stream towards the end a little bit. Um, which I know it's not necessarily your domain of expertise, but I think it's just an interesting thing in the time of uh, where we are in the time in the world to, to talk about that and how we can engage people virtually. Um, but are there any trends that you're seeing in terms of engaging youth donors? uh currently that um you would you would give to uh, advice to a nonprofit. i mean i would say trends that i i would say the biggest trend i'm seeing is youth want to be met at where they find like interest so what i mean by that is you like a lot of youth something that a lot of youth that i find care about is climate change. A lot of youth care about climate change and some of the biggest like celebrities that the youth emulate these days, like Billie Eilish. Billie Eilish is always talking about climate change. These kids are crazy about climate change. So if you approach them about like something that's not climate change, like maybe they'll be interested, but you want to engage them. It's like being in the classroom. You want to engage the students. I was able to engage my students because I was young and I knew the things that they liked because they liked things that I liked when I was a kid. And it's about like, you don't, they, you've seen kids bully older teachers and substitute teachers because they're not engaged. So I would say meet the kids, the youth, where they're at, figure out what they like and engage them like that. And then get them involved in the giving. And who knows, maybe they'll be so into it. Eventually they're going to want to branch off into other things that your nonprofit focuses on. Did I, am I answering the question properly? Yeah. I, I mean, I'll let Nolan follow up if he has any additional questions there, but I think you're dropping a lot of pieces of wisdom there that are, that are helpful. And I, and I think like at the end of the day, you're right. Like it's, and, and I don't, I don't have kids, but I just think of myself as a kid where my mom love my mom. If you're watching mom, I love you so much. Um, but would tell me, Hey, you know, what do you think about this program? This after school activity uh, would, 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 would nudge me to do things in, in a very supportive way, but I would almost always, do my own thing. It was always, right. you know, and it was always me charting my own course. I mean, you see that now I'm an entrepreneur right. and doing that in this way, like this is my version of, of, of that. Um, this is my version of my passion, like showing itself. Um, but for right. so many youth uh, doing that, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's hard to sort of, uh, or it's, I think it's naive to think you can uh, just sort of present or, 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 um, I guess, influence that in such a direct way. Uh, you have right. to meet them where they are and uh, right. what they're already interested in. And, and that's where I would start is like, your, your, your mission uh, is your mission and your focus, but in youth engagement is important for reasons you've already articulated. So how do we do it? Well, you gotta, you gotta find those people who are already excited about what you're working on and, and use that right. as sort of your starting point. I mean, one question I wanted to ask you going back to the Facebook fundraising is, was that just you by yourself, just individually, or were you, were you, was there a team that you were working with? Was that, um, 
something that, or was that just something that you, you just individually, you, you saw this in schools and were passionate and wanted to, wanted to create change as Dante and, and just started a Facebook fundraiser uh, and, and, and went from there. It was just me. And the reason why it was able to work is because I had engaged my audience. Um, I would go and I'd use my Facebook feed. Half of it was jokes because I was going out and doing stand up. So I test jokes on my Facebook feed and people would come for the funny. And then I'd be like, hey, uh, this child's parent has been gone for two weeks. They're not going to be able to learn when they're worried that, you know, where mom is. And people would kind of, they'd see that and they'd be like, whoa, I never thought of that that way. My parents were always home bothering me as a teenager. This child's parent isn't even home. And I kind of engaged them like that. So when I finally came, I was like, you know what? I'm tired of just typing. I'm tired of just talking about stuff. I want to do something. Here's a fundraiser. I was able to do it as just me. Hmm. So that's a great segue to this question from Chloe, because you, it sounds like you were, you were, you were super proactive. Like you went out and you made it happen. Let's say you have someone in, in, in you kind of, it seems like you almost like transitioned where you, you had this sort of match uh, that you noticed from Facebook and giving Tuesday, you started getting more involved with, and maybe, maybe someone or people at giving Tuesday, maybe were helping coach you, but we have a question from Chloe. Like, let's say you have someone like a, a young version of yourself who is right. fundraising for your organization oh, or, or interested in fundraising uh, for your, for, for your nonprofit. What would, what would be your advice for how you would coach that youth fundraiser? Like someone who is young and excited to support you and wants to fundraise for you how would you advise coaching them? Or is it really at the end of the day, like that is the individual? Cause I think the individual is going to be taking that action, but what can a nonprofit do to set them up for success? I guess would be the question there. Are we asking how we can use kids to fundraise for us? No, let's say you have someone that's engaged. I mean, not, not in like, right. I mean, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds not so Sorry. great. <laughs> um, but um, the question from Chloe is just, what's the best way to coach youth fundraisers? What strategies would speak the most to them? I'm paraphrasing. I would say yeah, I would say that, again, it's all about support. I don't know if there's much coaching that you can do. I think that you have a young person that is engaged and you say, oh, here's a tool. Here's a platform that you can use to fundraise. Here's Give Butter. Here's Facebook fundraising. Here's whatever. You can use this. Let me help you find some facts to back up your fundraiser because people aren't going to want to you know, support your fundraiser if they think you're scamming them or if they think you don't know what you're talking about. I think in, it's more about supporting than coaching. You're not going to be able to coach or coerce them into raising a bunch of funds for your nonprofit. It's really about giving them the tools and letting them lead. And then honestly, reflecting on them as well, reflecting with them as well. Because if they do something and then it's like, yeah, you did it, bye. Um, that's not going to help. Like if you want them to think, oh, maybe I can reach higher next time, have them reflect on how the, how the fundraising went. Did it go as well as we thought it would? Did it not? Like kids still need that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're getting a lot of really great questions uh, in the Q and A. Thank you for everyone who's sending those in. I will continue to get to those as we go. I want to flip the script though for a second, Dante, because I know you, and I want to be, I want to clarify for everyone, like the most, your program at Giving Tuesday Spark is really focused on youth themselves. Like you're working directly with youth on how they can give back in a lot of different ways. I don't want to speak for you and what you're doing. Do you mind sharing a little bit about Giving Tuesday Spark and like what you're actually focused on in sort of the lead up to Giving Tuesday, what your, what your work entails? Sure. Um, so Giving Tuesday Spark, Pretty much, I mean, it is in it to its core a youth-led movement. It's so youth-led that it was literally started by a young person, um, Chloe Thompson. She was 12 at the time. She slid into the DMs of Giving Tuesday. She was like, "Hey, can kids get involved? Like, this is really cool." And Giving Tuesday was like, "Yeah, that's cool." And then, literally, Chloe started what was Giving Tuesday Kids, and she rallied. She asked friends from around the globe because she already owned her own nonprofit, Chloe Cares. Um, and they got on board and they started working as kind of like an ambassador team for Giving Tuesday. And then the program was so successful, they wanted to expand and move into like teens, young adults, college students. And then they brought me on because I worked with older, you know, older age people. Um, and they wanted me to help, I guess, realize that vision. Um, so the way Giving Tuesday Spark um, 
operates pretty much is we have a very, very low access, um, low barriers to access model, which partly that's one of the reasons why I signed up for it. Um, pretty much we try to engage youth and we're like, hey, young people, Giving Tuesday is coming up. Do something, do anything, do anything that you want. As long as it's generous, if you want to fundraise for an organization, do that. If you want to mow the lawn for your neighbor who can't come outside because of COVID, do that. If you want to write nice smiley letters to teachers, do that. If you want to sew masks for um, workers, uh, frontline workers, do that. Whatever you want to do, just use hashtag Giving Tuesday, and hashtag Giving Tuesday Spark, to document it on social media and reflect and keep it going. And that's kind of how we operate. There's no like coaching. It's just like we pop in and we're like, hey, that's a cool fundraiser. Can we connect you with this nonprofit? Can we connect you with this person? Can we, you know, help you here? Do you want to apply for this grant? Do you want to do this? And when people feel more supported than more, less like a tool, like they feel like they're being supported and you're working with them and not as like a tool to fundraise for them, they're going to be more likely to stick around. Mm-hmm. Kids, like you, their parents in this chat, teens don't like to be bossed around. We know this, like teens are gonna be like, get out of here. But if you're like, hey, like we're gonna support you. They're like, oh, I don't trust this, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> yep. Um, I think this is this is awesome, Dante. I appreciate all the, uh, uh, the tips there. We have a couple questions about TikTok, social media, Snapchat. Um, if you were to sort of summarize, I guess, state of the union when it comes to social media and youth, where are they hanging out? What are the platforms? Um, and where are you seeing, I guess, like the most, I guess, social activism? Uh, is it TikTok really that like things are meaning, like meaningful things are happening? Or like you, you mentioned how you started off Facebook fundraisers. Like if you were to do a similar thing today, would that still be a Facebook fundraiser or would that be some sort of TikTok donation? fundraiser is there you know what are some of the the sort of mainstream social media outlets that youth can use and are using to give back hmm. this is a tough one um <laughs> so i would say um and this is just right off the bat for anyone watching young kids are not on facebook we ruined that like in 2016 when we all started fighting over politics all the time on facebook kids aren't there they don't want to be around that they're on tiktok they're on Instagram, they're in Twitch, they're in Discord, they found other places to be. So that's the first thing. If you're trying to engage youth, I would not try to do it on Facebook or Twitter. Twitter's, Twitter's also just constantly fighting. A lot of kids aren't there either. Um, to your question about if TikTok is a place to fundraise or start doing like fundraising there, I think they're just adding the tools now. I know we have a webinar coming up with them and I think they're just adding the tools to do that. Instagram added them last year that was announced at the Facebook matching, um, uh, whatever thing that I told you about that I was at, um, Mm -hmm. press conference, yeah. Um, So they're just getting on board with that. Um, So to further answer the question, I do see a lot of activism, I guess what people will refer to as slacktivism um, by young people on TikTok, like, if you open TikTok right now, there's just a whole lot of like, like kids just dropping facts on all sorts of stuff, like climate change, systemic racism. When the George Floyd stuff happened, TikTok was all like kids, teens telling you about like systemic racism. It was wild. And I'm interested to see now that they're adding these tools to run fundraisers, are the teens going to take that effort that they're putting into making these videos? Are they going to, you know, start fundraising? We don't know. I mean, at Giving Tuesday, we are a big believer in calls to action. So like you can engage your youth, you can reach out, you can make videos, you can whatever, but you have to, you have to give them a call to action. You have to give them something to take your presentation or what you talk to them about and go apply it into the real world. It's just like me as a teacher, I can't teach a whole lesson and then not assess my students or not give them homework. Like you need to know if they understood it, they need to be able to take what they were taught and go apply it into the real world. 100%. I want to just wrap up this, this segment here to, to for someone who might be a young person watching and thinking about how can I get involved? You know, I, I, 
I've been in, in, in those shoes. I've talked to a lot of youth, uh, college aged and below who are like, I want to give back. I want to do something. Uh, I want to, I want to have an impact. You know, where do I start? What do I do? Uh, right. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like giving Tuesday spark is really that place. That's that can be your starting point to say, Hey, here's how I'm thinking about it. Here's a cause I'm passionate about. And you're really just like, you're the, you're connecting the dots or you're helping bridge the gap between someone who's like, wants to do that, wants to give and, and figuring out how the best outlet is for them to do that. Um, is that a place you'd sort of recommend as a starting point uh, for them uh, in thinking about that? Where would you start as a young person who's sort of thinking about, I want to do something, I want to give, I have a cause maybe I'm passionate about, but what do I, what's the first step I take? I would say, and I think this is why the Spark model is proving to be so successful so far, is I would encourage that young person to start with non-monetary generosity because like, again, it's, it's about engaging and you're not gonna engage someone like if you just are like, hey, I'm suddenly really interested in this thing, donate money. Like, oh my God, someone else is asking me to donate money. Like that doesn't engage people. We don't listen when bill collectors are calling. Why would we, you know? So if you want to get these youth involved you need to let them know probably non-monetary generosity is the way to start because anyone can do it it'll get attention. It will make other people feel good and they'll want to pay attention. They'll be like, hey, it's this random kid who gave me a smile. It's this random kid who gave me a gift card. Like this kid's all right. What is this kid up to now? And I think that that's where a lot of like organizations and nonprofits, they kind of struggle because they start with, oh, you're interested. Okay. Start fundraising, start getting money, start getting money for us. And it's like, that's, it's, it's not, and this is just my opinion. I don't think it's sustainable. I think you should start with getting people's attention with non-monetary generosity. And then over time, once you have engaged, mix in some fundraisers with that non-monetary generosity. It's not all about money. Awesome. I think that ties back to on both sides. It's like, that's your advice to a young person. If you're a nonprofit watching that too, and thinking about that, like it's, you know, it, it's sort of a, a, a two-way thing. And, and I think it's important if you're, a nonprofit thinking about this too, to ask yourself, like, do we have those non-monetary pathways for people who want to give to give? Or is it literally like, are we just saying, Hey, here's a peer to peer fundraising campaign you can join. And that's like, your you want to get involved. Like, is that your get involved action? Um, or are there other right. ways you can introduce non-monetary giving there for when that person comes, you have other options there for engaging that young person. Right. Is that a question or are you just reiterating that's just i'm just riffing off of your, your okay. excellent points not today <laughs> thank you no, i was um, just i was gonna say you have no idea how many times like i've looked like we had giving tuesday now on may 5th um and granted like the nonprofit sector was like really struggling and that's why we decided to have giving tuesday now because we knew it needed the help but most of what i saw from the nonprofits that worked with the youth it was just like hey donate to us donate to us and i'm like even if you're struggling with money you can still write nice letters. You can still document a kid reading a story for some parent who works from home for their child on Zoom. Like there's so many nice things that you can be doing, but mm -hmm. you won't do the non-monetary generosity first. And I'm just like, I feel like if you start with that and then mix in the fundraising, it'll be much more successful. Definitely. I have a, there's a really great question from Megan in the chat about just with COVID-19, in-person volunteering isn't safe. Any other examples of how to engage given this constraint? I would I would say to that, um, like that that is is, is certainly um, something to be cognizant of in like the world that we're in is taking all like necessary measures like safety right. coming first. Um, but I do think that there are opportunities to even engage in conversation. Uh, and like one thing I want to transition to is to talk a little bit about virtual events live streaming and how to do facilitate a dialogue through that. Um, Dante, is there any advice you could, you would add to that for Megan to think about how maybe a non-monetary action you can offer a young person? I think the, oh, the other thing I was going to say on top of that was just, it is so, um, you know, specific to your organization. I mean, it's, it's, you know, what that non-monetary thing could be, I think just varies a lot based on the yeah. mission of your organization and what, what you do. So it's, it might be a little hard to give sort of general advice on that, but Dante, would you add anything yeah. about an option you can make available to engage non-monetarily with a young person that's not volunteering? 
um, like with the COVID restrictions or? Yeah, with the COVID restrictions, I think probably is specifically the concern. Right. Uh, I mean, so we had a list on our website and we came up with a list for um, Giving Tuesday now. Awesome. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things like kids um, spreading. Well, one, we have one of our Spark, our legacy Spark leaders, Sammy. Um, she's based in Indiana and she literally just like sent smile stickers to her teachers. Um, we had one of our Spark leaders, CJ, he sent out virtual gift cards to people. We've had our Spark leaders, they've like made blessing bags that you can do in the safety of your home and then drop them off somewhere for people who need them. We've had uh, a sorority participated in, are their names Omega Phi Alpha, and they participated in Giving Tuesday Now. And they did uh, generosity bingo, where the sisters, like the national put out this bingo board. And then they had like, like little things on the bingo board. And it's like, call a sister who may have not you haven't spoke to in a while and see how they're doing or like all these different types of generosity. And then you filled in the board whenever you did one of those acts of generosity. And then you got like a prize or something from nationals. Um, so it's just, it's about adapting because honestly, things aren't going back to, I, I don't know if anyone else is, it's, we're not going back. Like I know COVID spot, like spurred this stuff on, but we're not going back to the way things were. You know how much money we're saving by doing everything online and having hybrid schools. Yeah. And so on that, things may not be the way they were. One of those I think that we'll continue to see is live stream and or a hybrid approach, right? Can we take, right. you know, a safe distant virtual or, or in-person event once it's safe to do so? Um, and as we start hopefully phasing that in, um, still maybe incorporating a virtual component. One thing we're seeing with GiveButter is the how much wider of a net you can cast with a virtual event right. versus an in-person event. And also how you can reduce the barrier where it's not a $500 ticket to go to the gala. It could actually be a much right. lower admission, if not free, where we suggest optional donations. And since it's a virtual event, you have no overhead or very low overhead. And so the margins are just drastically bigger. So um, right. what are some, some things that you're talking about or thinking about over at Giving Tuesday when it comes to live streaming and virtual events. Um, we're talking about that a lot here uh, and how you can use that both leading up to the day of the of Giving Tuesday on December 1st, uh, on December 1st, and then using that almost as a kickoff maybe for your year end giving. Um, are there any sort of creative examples of live stream that you're seeing or, or any tips or advice on the live stream front um, that, you're, that you're thinking about over at Giving Tuesday? Hmm, good question. Um... Maybe young, but I'm not live streaming young. Um, <laughs> we're live. We're live I, now. We did live yesterday. Right. You're officially say, a streamer. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> I would say one of uh, our legacy Spark leaders. His name is Raciel. He's based in Puerto Rico. Um, he is setting out to host a gaming tournament, and he's working with a nonprofit called uh, Game Gamers for Good. Games for Good. And they are going to be live streaming. They're going to pretty much have participants sign up on Giving Tuesday because like Giving Tuesday is on a Tuesday and young people have school. So they're not going to be able to participate. So it's going to have them sign up and kind of take advantage of all the people who have eyes on social media on Giving Tuesday. Um, have them sign up on that day. And then the following Saturday, have them participate in this gaming tournament. And then they're going to be, uh, I think they call it shoot casting, whatever the, the people at the nonprofit called it. Um, but they're pretty much going to be streaming it to Twitch, um, streaming it to the Giving Tuesday Twitch, and then they're going to be having the players who are participating streaming it to their personal channels as well. So I think that might be what you're talking about with the live streaming. Um, yeah, I love that. I mean, I think it's 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 a very exciting opportunity to like when you talk about that sort of like multi-platform streaming in the sort of innovative uh format of it it's something that like you would never see a year ago like or, or you might right. see it but it would be a such a it would be a much more niche activity um right. and now like that might be your only opportunity to have that communal engagement uh right. and i think so it's a lot of it's just top of mind for a lot of organizations for like how do we how do we either replace an event that typically takes place uh, maybe once or twice a year that's accounting for a significant percentage of our revenue 
as an organization, right. like it's critical for us to continue. Now we can't have it. Uh, the sort of iteration of that is well, we can't have an in-person event. We have to have a virtual event uh, and right. incorporating live stream. One, one distinction we've been making or trying to, trying to make is that you can almost segment a live stream out from a, from a virtual event. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to go live. You can still pre-record video, hit play right. at a certain time, kind of, you know, reduces sort of the stakes and you can kind of uh, prep the video to, to the extent you need to, and then, and then have that go live at a certain time. Uh, but I do think that um, there are so many options, so many platforms, it can be a little bit overwhelming, especially right. Uh, it feels like probably a big leap to go from all this in-person planning logistics to now we're like, zoom to facebook to like a give butter page and then there's a donate button and it's right. just a totally new ball game um and so right. i think it'd be just so interesting to see what people come up with this giving tuesday and just in general for their events um for that and it's cool to see that you have a spark youth uh member that's that's already doing something like that it sounds so is there a campaign that already happened or it's happening uh it's coming up um, so we're just, it's in the planning right now. We're still working out details with the nonprofit. Um, but yeah, he's going to kick it off. We're going to start promoting probably uh, really in like a week or two and then have the sign up on Giving Tuesday and then. Awesome. Very exciting. Well, hopefully we can send that our way and we can share it. That sounds like an awesome campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. One question, and I, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm hitting uh, notes of people's questions in the Q&A. I think one thing I love about all your answers, Dante, is you, you give advice, but then you're giving like a lot of practical examples. So I hope people can take away like, oh, that's like inspiring for me to maybe implement or, 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 or take that idea and, and, and make it our own. Um, one of the questions that I've heard a lot from people, and I saw one or two of those in the Q&A uh, was about donor fatigue. It's a big, it's I feel same. like I keep hearing this, this phrase, like I never heard that at all. And now I'm it's like donor fatigue, donor fatigue, donor fatigue. Uh, my question is how real is donor fatigue and is it something that you should be even thinking about? Because does it actually materially change anything that you're doing as an organization uh, in, in, in your approach to fundraising? Um, yeah. Right. Well, let me use the Socratic method and counter with a question for everyone in the audience. Uh, if you have a friend who only calls you to be like, hey, can I have some money? And then like you give them money and then they call again. And they're like, hey, hope you've been well. Can I have some money? And then they just only keep calling you for money. Are you going to want to keep that friend around? Probably not because they're, they're, they're being a, excuse me for lack of a better term, they're being a bum. Like you don't want to associate yourself with people who only want stuff out of you. So when we look at like people who fundraise and the funders and the people who participate and like donate, yeah, donor fatigue is a very real thing. And that's why I keep pushing the importance of non-monetary generosity to your donors. Like there needs to be some type of symbiotic thing going on. Like nobody wants to hang out with that friend that constantly asks you for money. You're going to be like, don't you have a job? Get a job. Like you know, so yeah, donor fatigue is very serious. And I think you need to factor that in. And I understand that things, COVID has changed a lot of things for the nonprofit sector. But I think that even though it's changed things for us, I don't think that people suddenly now are going to be more, you know, warming up to people who constantly ask you for money. That's just my take on it. I could be wrong, but I think it's very real. And I think the best way to counteract it is letting the people know that it's, it's you know, you're there for them too. And maybe setting up a system where you ask these people to donate some time or ask these people to donate another time. Or you, the yep. last thing you want is when someone's just like, I'm just going to unsubscribe. Like, I'm so done with all the emails. I'm so done with all the texts. I'm so done with you asking me for money. I'm out. Then they're not engaged and you just lost a potential donor. Yep, absolutely. So we are at the 245 mark and I wanted to leave some time for questions. We've been, we've been tackling them as we go. Um, and thank you for everyone who's been submitting them. I see two that I've, I've had left here that I feel like we've covered in, in parts. 
uh, throughout the last 45 minutes. So Dante, I'll, I'll send them your way. If you feel like we've already kind of covered that one, or you want to just give a short, uh, answer there, feel free. One's from Janet. Um, and also I love, I love, uh, interviewing a comedian, uh, or, or doing this with a comedian. It's just like, this is so much more fun. Um, besides the messaging, Janet wants to know, besides the messaging, what's the best way to reach youth donors? Is it using a multi-channel approach or just using Facebook slash Instagram text messaging with a text to give approach? That's the question. The question is the best way to reach youth. Is it using Facebook or Instagram or asking them through text? Yeah, I think it's a sort of a channel question around, um, is it using a multi-channel approach, just Facebook, Insta, text messaging with a text to give approach? Um, is there something I, that you would say would be the best way to reach youth donors? To reach youth, Again, I'd start with non-monetary generosity, but I also, we overlook this a lot. Um, I would go for the teachers because teachers can successfully, we can sway kids to do things. So if you approach a teacher and you're like, hey, uh, you're like, I was social studies. So fundraising would totally fit into my curriculum. So like, hey, um, maybe we can team up with you and we can like write out a curriculum about like, you know, giving and fundraising or whatnot and how fundraising can lead to community advocacy knowledge for kids. Um, and yeah, and then you can use that and the kids can fundraise for, you know, an organization that may happen to be mine. I think approaching the teachers though is important though, because we, they, they can get the kids, they, first of all, they know how to get ideas in the kids head better than the parent. They know how to see if the kids understanding, they know how to convince kids, kids emulate their teachers. Um, and teachers know other teachers. We know a bunch of teachers because we're constantly complaining to each other about how annoying our profession is. And once you tap into that network of angry teachers, you have a whole bunch of other teachers who now are gonna you know, get involved and teach their kids. So I'd say, instead of going to Facebook, which I already said, there's no kids there, I would go to the teachers. I would go to where the kids are. That's awesome advice. Um... One thing we did with Give Butter in the early days when we were just trying to grow this new thing that we launched, we were getting some success on our own college campus. Uh, was a somewhat right. similar approach where we we would reach out to the student leaders, so like the mm -hmm. president of an organization or the uh, advisors of many organizations, and kind of go top down. And so we would say, right, sort of a we would have sort of a, a double approach. It's kind of going back to what you said earlier. Would, would you be interested in getting involved? You know, we weren't we weren't necessarily saying uh, use use this product, you know, in a very direct sort of salesy way. It was just would you would be would you be interested in getting involved either as an ambassador or just participating uh, in some way with with what we're doing here at Give Butter? Here's what we're all about. And would you right. also be interested in forwarding this to the organization? So it would sort of be a double ask. They personally are going to reach out to, but also. A lot of them have listservs and Facebook pages. And so it's kind of a right. crafty way to just get the word out um, in a community through, through sort of going like top down. But yeah, from the, from the, from the teacher's mouth, I think that's like an amazing, uh, an amazing tip right there. Um, so Emily asked, and this is, I think along the lines of uh, slacktivism and um, just like information consumption, like there's so much information all the time. Did you watch the social dilemma? The documentary was on Netflix, sort of like, a. Oh, it's, no. it's sort I of depressing. Way trashier TV. <laughs> Came out kind of recently. Um, but it, a lot of it talks about just like how social media determines what you consume based on everything you do, whether how much time you're spending on a post and all this sort of stuff and in cr sort of crafting your social media feed. And there's just so much information out there and how social media kind of like curates what you see. Um, but that is nothing that Emily said. Emily's question was, is it harder to reach Gen Z since they consume so much different information? And does that make it difficult to quote, meet them where they are? Is it harder to reach Gen Z because they have access to so much information? Does that make it difficult to meet them where they are? Um, hmm. I think, 
Yes and no, because like even so Max and I are young, like he's 25, I'm 27. We we're digital immigrants. So like, you know, computers came into play when we were little, but before that we had like pencils and that other stuff I forgot about. But a lot of Gen Z, literally they're born with computers and they just like, just Google everything. Like I, when we started doing virtual teaching when COVID happened, I had a student, they sent in like, I, we, had, we were doing a unit on Hinduism and she sent in an answer and like, I was like, Sophie, did you copy this from Google? And she's like, no. And I'm like, then why is it written in Sanskrit? And then she just had no, like, she had no way to defend it. Like these kids constantly are on Google. And I think that makes it difficult for us because we had to learn from like textbooks and stuff like that. Um, so I think that's the disconnect between us and them, like Google, like them successfully being able to teach themselves from Google and YouTube presents a disconnect. Um, but I think because they have access to so much information, they are much more primed, I think, than let's say Max and I or people in the audience would have been when they were younger. Like we were worried about like rolling around in the dirt. And there are kids who are in fifth grade and they're starting nonprofits and, you know, doing vote voting uh, campaigns, like getting people to register to vote. Um, so I think that because they're a lot more aware now because of access for information, it might be easier to get them to want to care about things that we care about as adults. As long as you're able to get past that disconnect of we were taught this way they literally learn from YouTube and Google, how do we reach them regardless? Yeah, I, I like to think Dante, we were born in this sort of golden age where we like grew up without a cell phone. So right. still like hung out in person, like did all like, I had a Game Boy that was like my big tech innovation yes. when I was a kid, like Game Boy Color. Um, yes. And, you know, cell phones kind of came in when I was in like high school. And so it wasn't, it's just a different level of connectivity and a different level of, I think, appreciation and distant from the thing versus my younger sister, seven years younger, who's like that. It's just like, it's just a, such a different, just like time to grow up in, um, right. in that, it, but it's like, we're not that far apart. Seven years, just doesn't feel like that much, but it's when you're right. growing up and going through that, where you're constantly connected to the internet, uh, it's a very different way of consuming information uh, and sort of, and leveraging it uh, in your life uh, for accessing all sorts of information. So I love, I love your answer to kind of like uh, distinguish between those. Uh, there's a question from Yoni that asks, uh, does anyone ever do a philanthropy day? Uh, I think they may be asking about, uh, there's a lot of days of giving that kind of revolve community days um, uh, of giving that happen in and around Giving Tuesday. Is there a resource that you know of or you could point to someone who may want to get involved locally or for days of giving or philanthropy days or anything like that that you know of for Giving Tuesday? Because I, I know that that I know there's a lot of campaigns that pop up days of giving, giving days around Giving Tuesday. Do you know of any places we could direct Yoni to to learn more about philanthropy days or giving days around Giving Tuesday? Um, I'm kind of confused with the question. They want to know where we can direct people who want to participate in Giving Days. Yeah, well, they asked if anyone ever does an event on philanthropy day. Uh, we're giving Tuesday, maybe. So I'm not sure I understand the question. Yoni, if you want to ask in a different way, I'd love to take a stab at it. But um, yeah. Um, all right. So those were those were questions. Megan asked a question about uh, virtual game nights. You mentioned a bingo uh, example. So hopefully we, we kind of covered that one. Megan, uh, I've definitely seen some really fun and successful game nights. I highly recommend checking out this thing called Kahoot. Uh, it's a really fun way to do trivia. Um, and there's there's a lot, they've gotten like pretty sophisticated with it too over over the last like six months. It's kind of cool to see yeah. it evolve with different different things and everything from just like a low key, just like hanging out with friends and you want to like do trivia. Um, Lorraine has a suggestion for Jackbox. I've never tried Jackbox. You, you that know Jackbox? That for kids. Yeah, that's okay. like me <laughs> and my friends. We're like, Jackbox is pretty twisted. I would probably stick with Kahoot for kids or I guess teens could do Jackbox or Cards Against Humanity or something online. Yeah. Awesome. We got another plus one for Jackbox uh, from Aaron. <laughs> so noted about the, um, uh, the, the distinction there. Um, okay. Well, 
Dante, those, those are, those are all my questions. And I think we've covered the ones from the audience. Uh, any parting words of wisdom for, uh, our attendees? Hmm. Parting words of wisdom. Wow. Uh, <laughs> well, I would say that kids are like, I, I probably said this before, but kids know way more than we give them credit for. Um, and all kids need, they already have the passion. They need you to help them sustain it. And they need you to give them the tools and resources because kids don't have money yet to hold these events. They don't have like credit scores or whatnot. So that's where they need it. They don't need you to tell them what to care about. They don't need you to tell them, you know, what needs to be done. Um, so I would say it's okay to come to terms with the fact that kids know things better than us. I grew up with adults always assuming they knew better. Um, some kids know better. I, you know, I can admit that kids know better. Kids know better internet than me now. And the internet, we grew up with it and it's just different now. Kids know social media better than me now. Um, so I think as adults, we really need to be humble and accept that kids know things better than us in some areas. Um, and I think we need to have that play into our strategies and another part of a uh, parting word I would give would be that there's so many kids out there that your nonprofits are not reaching out to. I recently spoke with a nonprofit and they're like, yeah, we go into like schools and we have teachers do these programs for the kids and the kids learn how to fundraise and then a portion goes to our nonprofit. And guess what? They only went to private schools. So you're only tapping into like kids who have parents who are well off and already have all these opportunities. And it's like, you never know, there could be a kid in the hood, like the school that I taught at, that could bring a whole lot to your organization. It may not be money right now, but it could be, you know, partnerships from other orgs. It can be a really cool ambassador that's going to make other kids want to join your youth engagement movement that a boring, stuffy, rich kid isn't going to be able to do. Like, there's so many things, but I think a lot of organizations are cutting themselves off to these audiences um, and you're missing out. I'm telling you. Awesome. Dante, thank you so much for joining and sharing your wisdom and your story. Uh, <laughs> I know I can speak for, well, I don't know I can speak, but like I took a lot away personally from this and I'm excited to have this as a recording to share with others who are, I'm sure have very similar questions to what have been asked here today. Um, this stuff, a lot of what you shared, I think is timeless and in a really great message until the next wave of social media or who knows what comes next, but right. um, appreciate you for sharing all your, your insights. If someone wants to connect with you or continue the conversation with you or Giving Tuesday, where can they find you? Uh, you can find us at givingtuesdayspark.org. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram at Mr. So M-I-S-T-E-R underscore flush, F-L-U-S-H. That's what the kids called me in school. So I just kind of, <laughs> you know, rolled with it. Um, okay. Yeah, you could just email us through our website um, if you want to hop on a call one day and just talk over stuff. If you want to get involved for Giving Tuesday, if you want to start a Spark chapter for Giving Tuesday Spark, yeah, hit us up. Awesome. So I should have given you a slide, but I, I have a slide here for, for Give Butter. If anyone's interested in learning more about Give Butter or just wants to get in touch with us, that's our email, hello at givebutter.com. Dante, thank you again so much. And thanks to everyone who was here for all the questions and joining and hope to see you at the next one. And on Giving Tuesday, December 1st. Woo. Bye everyone. <laughs> thanks again, Dante. See ya.